Facebook find it posted on our Facebook page, New Vision Christian Fellowship. You'll know you're in the right place when you see the profile picture of our pastor, Bishop George Kirby II. Today's topic is the million dollar violin. A violinist announced that he would play a concert on a one million dollar Stradivarius violin. The hall was filled and the violinist began to play. The music was sweet. The violin cried like a baby, sang like a bird, laughed like a child. The crowd was enraptured. Did you ever hear such music? What a priceless violin. When the thunderous applause died down, the violinist took the violin and broke it into pieces on a chair. They said, he's crazy, he is mad, he's breaking a one million dollar violin. But the violinist reached behind him and pulled out another violin, smiled and said, ladies and gentlemen, you thought I was playing on a one million dollar violin, but it was only a fifty dollar fiddle. This is how a one million dollar violin sounds. He played again, but the music wasn't any sweeter. Did you know why it was no better? Because it wasn't the violin, but the talented artist who draws the bow that makes the beautiful music. It's the same with us and God. We are only the instruments being used by the masterful violinist. First Peter 2 and 9 says, But you are the ones chosen by God, chosen for the high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy people, God's instruments to do his work and speak out for him. The song writer Rod Canoli offers to us these words. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, and my feet. Touch my heart and speak through me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Our prayer is to always be a ready instrument and willing vessel to be used in whatever way God desires for us to be. Keep this message close to your heart. You will live a better life. God bless you. Deacons, deaconess, 
those, amen, uh, that we see and we don't see. Amen. We thank God for our First Lady, Sister Robin. Thank God for, amen, uh, the praise team taking us into worship, reminding us who it is that we serve. How great a God he is. Yeah. So we are blessed today to be able to stand before you. God has given us a word that a man gave to us on last weekend. So that thing has been marinating in my spirit all week. And I believe it's a word for somebody today. Look at your neighbor and look him in the eye and ask him, is this a message for you? I think it's a message for me. Hallelujah. We're going to begin, amen, uh, in, as I said in the book of 2 Samuel chapter number 4. Also 2 Samuel chapter number 9. And we're going to be dealing with this, amen, uh, for a little bit uh, on Tuesday night. Uh, as we've said before, that when we preach, we proclaim. But when we teach, we explain. And so on Tuesday night, we trust that we will be dealing with the nuts and bolts with what we'll be proclaiming today. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have today. We thank you for life, health, and strength. One more day walking on the top soil. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for a reasonable portion of health and strength. We thank you, Lord, for those, Lord, who have gone through the challenge of COVID. Father, we thank you for those who are yet enduring it. Father, we ask for you to look upon those that are sick and afflicted with other ailments and issues going on in their lives. Father, we ask today that a word will come to us that will cause us, Lord, give, give us that spark that we need. Ignite our spirits and our souls, Lord, so that we can be the men and women that you're calling for. Now bless us today and we will be blessed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Second Samuel chapter number one, chapter number four, rather, verse number four. We'll read one verse of scripture there. And Jonathan, Saul's son had a son who was lame in his feet. He was five years old when the news came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened that as she made haste to flee, he fell and became lame. And his name was the fellowship. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading of his word and sanctify it in our hearts. And we trust that we will receive something out of the word that comes forth on today. Amen. As we look at things that have transpired in our lives, we can all come to the same conclusion that somewhere, somehow, some way, or some point in time, someone either failed us yes. or we have failed somebody. Yes. Life has an uncanny way 
of throwing some of the worst things at some of the best people. In life, it seems that you strive to take two steps forward only to find yourself falling a step or two behind. We progress some, and then you experience a setback, a problem, or some difficulty. You can find your sister, your father, your, 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 your brother, your, your, your mother, your, your road dog. Uh, when you confide in them for a word of encouragement and they tell you something like what you're going through really isn't significant or you're making a mountain out of a molehill. Yet in the middle of your challenge, your frustration, your weakness, and in the midst of your mental anguish, you can still find strength to help somebody else. Mephibosheth was of the royal lineage. His grandfather was King Saul. His father was a prince, the next in line for the throne. Mephibosheth uh, was born in the palace and carried with him all the trappings and advantages of the privileged. Come on. Come on and say that the kids, king, the king's kids have privileges. The king's kids have privileges. Word then comes to those that are in the palace of the death of both King Saul and Prince Jonathan. Undoubtedly, uh, this brought immediate concern and fears as they grip the fact that if the capital is besieged, the life of the only living heir to the throne may be at risk of being killed. Then the nurse, his caregiver, the one who had his best interest in heart, as she tried, notice this, to protect him with everything she had, she attempted to get him to safety. But in her haste, grabbing the child and running with the child to protect the child, she dropped it. My question to you today is who dropped you? Who dropped you? Who was it in your life that mishandled you? Yes, they meant well, but the end result of the matter crippled you for the rest of your life. I know they said they loved you, but their actions said something else. Have I got a witness? I know they said that they got your back, but, but when you turned around, they were nowhere to be found. Call me whenever you need me. But when you call, they don't pick up. Neither do they, do they respond to your texts. Even when you say, this is an emergency. Who dropped you? Tears are streaming down my face because of the pain that I am enduring. Seeing that I couldn't express my anguish to those that I thought would hold me up in the time of need. I'm heartbroken. Because I thought that when you said what you said, that you meant what you said. Only to find out that what you said was just idle words and vain promises. There are times 
When you've got to do as David did. When he felt alone. When he felt stressed and pressured and had no cheerleaders on the sideline, David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Who dropped you? Who had the responsibility of protecting you but failed? Who disappointed you? Who had the responsibility of nourishing you and failed? Was it a parent? Was it your spouse? Was it a school teacher? Was it a minister? Was it a church member? Who crushed your spirit that you can't see that there is a brighter day ahead. I wish I had somebody that would pray with us today. Who caused hurt in you that you see all men as dogs? Or you see all women's, women as damaged goods? Who dropped you? bad advice that changed the trajectory of your life's journey? Yeah. Yeah. Whose negative influence or false a doctrine has halted you from seeing the truth that is found in the Word of God? I'm going to preach to myself today. Who crippled you that you can't step into new experiences or take challenges who in your past has crushed you so much that your present day is stopped under the pressure of your yesterday. The fellowship lived a privileged life in the palace but was brought low to live in the ghetto town of Lodabar. Somebody said he lived in the ghetto. His life changed. He was living a privileged life. Like, like some folk, when you first get saved, you know that God is on your side. And you know that you're a king's kid. You, you, you know this, amen. But sometimes things begin to happen so much in your life that it brings, amen, you from being high on the Lord's side down. To the valley low. His life changed dramatically from what it was to what it has become. For the fellowships that are here, amen, in the sanctuary today, or for the fellowships that, amen, are listening to this, listening, amen, to this live stream. Your life, once thriving, has now been loaded. That's not, I'm talking, I'm not talking to everybody, but I think everybody can get something out of what I'm saying. You were once outgoing and energetic, but now you're recluse. You're recluse and lifeless. Once an optimist, now a pessimist, focusing now on what you don't have rather than the blessings that you do now possess. Once full of hope and dreams, now full of disappointments and discontentment. Once positive, believing God is able to do anything but fail, but now negative and having distrust in the church, in the preacher, and in organized religion. Now you're living in Lodabar. Challenged with depression and grief. Remorse and regret have now become your living companions. But God wants you to know that there is hope for you. 
Psalmist said, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, and I will yet praise him for the help of his countenance. As I said before, that David found out that he had to encourage himself. Amen. When David speaks this, this word of encouragement, who is he talking to? He's talking to himself. And sometimes we got to talk to ourselves. He says, amen, in the Amplified Bible, he's talking to himself. He says, why are you despair, O oh, my inner self? And why have you become re uh, a restless and disturbed within? He's talking to himself and saying, hope in God and wait expectation and wait expectantly for him. Amen. Uh, for I will again praise him for the help of his amen presence. He says, I'm going to hope in God and I'm going to wait expecting something. Sometimes, amen, we don't feel it. You don't see it, but you gotta expect it. Amen. When you know that there is something coming in the mail, you are looking out every day because you're expecting it. You gotta recognize that you gotta get to the place where you begin to expect that I'm coming out of this thing. Somebody say, Man. And then Isaiah 61 says, Amen, I've given you, this is what God says, beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That also means that he says, I've given you the garment of praise instead of a heavy burden and failing spirit. He says this is what I've given you. And sometimes amen you got to find yourself putting on the garment of praise. Amen. Sometimes you got to find yourself. Amen. As I found myself when I was down and disturbed within my spirit. I had in my closet I had it and a hanger that represented my garment of praise. And when the enemy would come in I'd go to that hanger, Brother James, and I'd act like there was a garment on it, and I'd put it on, and said, God, I'm going to give you some praise. I command my hands to praise you. I command my feet to praise you. I command my mouth to praise you. Sometimes you've got to give them that in the house of Saul that I may show my kindness for Jonathan's sake. King David wanted to show kindness to the descendants of Jonathan. Why? Because David had a close relationship with Jonathan. In 1 Samuel 18 and 1, it says Jonathan and David became, amen, bonded together in close relationship or friendship. Jonathan loved David as much as he did his own life. So David 
loved his brother who had died in battle. David is now king. And David one day is thinking about his brother. Thinking about how he loved him. And said, is there any of Jonathan's descendants that I can show love and kindness to? Well, Ziba said unto the king, well, Jonathan has a son which is lame on his feet. He's got issues. He's crippled. He can't walk. He's disabled. Jonathan, he's, he, 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 he's not able to, to do like other folk. What has happened to him because he was dropped, it has caused there to be some areas in his life that he has issues, that he's disabled in. Sometimes things can happen in our life that cripple us, that disable us. And, and if you think about it, it was not his fault. That's why I asked the question, who dropped you? Who crippled you? But now he's in a situation where, amen, he's not in the palace. He's in the lower bar. He doesn't have the privileges he once possessed. He's in the lower bar. He's crippled. Can't get by on his own. He's in Lodabar. And the king said unto Aziba, Where is he? Can I pause here to tell you what God told me to tell you? He said, I know exactly where you are. That's the first thing you got to get down in your spirit. That God knows exactly where you are. Psalm 139 says, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I run away from where you are? If I go to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and live in the farthest parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your hand will hold me up. God wants you to know he knows where you are and he wants you to know that he's still holding you up. You may not think he is, but he's there. Come on, tell somebody God is there. Exactly where you are. He also, amen, understands exactly what you're going through. The Hebrew writer said, We have a high priest which can be touched by the feelings of our infirmities. Jesus knows where you are, He knows what you're going through. He feels what you I heard a song on the stage. Jesus knows all about our struggles. And he'll die till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lonely Jesus. No, not one. Jesus understands. Jesus feels where you're feeling. I know I'm talking to somebody that's watching. Amen. Watching this live stream. And he wants you to know he's there with you. Amen. He feels your challenge. He knows what you're going through. And he's there to help you through. Verse number four of the ninth chapter continues. And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in Lodabar. 
Lord of our a low place. He knows where you are. Says you're in the ghetto. In Lodabar, you would find the lost. You'd find the unskilled. You'd find the uneducated. You'd find the outcast of society. In Lodabar, you'd find all the deeds. The discontent. Amen. The discouraged, those in distress, those depressed, those, amen, despondent, and yes, those in there. Look at your neighbor and tell him, God is prophesying to you today. And letting you know you're coming out of Lodabar. I promise you. And I'm not one to just say idle words. I'm not one to tell you something. Amen. If I say the, the, the Lord said something, hear me. He said it to you. You're coming out of Lodabar. Hallelujah. Matthew 12 and 37 says, By your words are you condemned, and by your words are you justified. It begins with us understanding or oh, what we speak out of our mouths. By your words, you can be con condemned to stay in Lodabar. Or you can be justified by your words. You can be just as if you never left the palace. Hallelujah. Ah, yeah. Just as if you're healthy, even though your body is broken. Hallelujah. Just as if you had the, the confidence that you once had, uh, the energy that you once had, uh, the outgoingness that you once had, uh, the power that you once had. How do you know that? The Bible said, let the weak say. You gotta start speaking it even though you don't feel it. You gotta start speaking it even though it doesn't look that way. You gotta start saying, God, your word said, I'm coming out of low bar. You gotta start speaking what he says. Amen. To override what your thoughts are. To override what has been in your heart and in your mind. You gotta start saying it by faith. I'm coming out of this thing. I'm coming out of debt. I don't care how low. Amen. My, 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 my uh, what do they call it? Credit score is. I'm coming out of this thing. I don't care how many bills come to my house. I'm coming out of this thing. I don't see it, but I'm coming out anyway. I don't feel it. I'm coming out anyway. The bill the building is not going to my door, but I'm coming out anyway. I've got to call those things that be not as though they were. I'm getting let the weak say I'm strong. The Proverbs 18 and 21 says, Amen. That life and death are in the power of the tongue. Can I say it this way? Your life, someone say my life. My death is in the power of of my tongue. Love, that's where it starts. Now when we deal, amen, we're going to deal with some practical things on Tuesday night and I want you to listen, amen, on Tuesday night because there are other things besides what I'm, I'm talking about. There are some natural, some physical things that we can do to help us out of Lodabar. Come on, someone say Amen. So it's not all just naming and claiming. 
black and red. It's not as simple as, amen, oh, I'm coming out. No, there's got to be, with the faith, there has to be some actions. And without works, your faith is dead. So God says there's some work that's got to be done to get out of this thing. Look at your neighbor and ask him, are you ready to work? Yeah, ready to work. It's more than I'm getting out of debt. You got to stop making bills. I'm getting out of debt. There's some things you got to do. You have to prioritize things, right? You're going to get out of debt. You, you got to get a budget, amen? Getting out of debt. There's some, there's some sacrifices that you got to make. There's some work is what I'm trying to tell you with your faith. But it begins with the conversations that are coming out of your mouth. Even if you're not feeling good, you got to say, I feel good today. It begins there. It begins, amen, with your making that determination through your mouth, amen, the confession. I told you that confession simply means that you are, are in agreement with the terms. When you confess, amen, uh, I am healed, you are, you are partnering or you're in agreement with what God's word says. Even though you're not there. Jesus. Let me get through here. Yes, Lord. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come to David, he fell down and, and reverenced him. And David said to Mephibosheth, he says, Behold thy servant, David, fear not, for I surely will show you kindness for for your daddy's sake. And I will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father. Thou shalt eat bread at my table forever. He doesn't say forever, but I'm thinking about God right now. He says continually. He says, I am going to restore Listen to this. The land of your father. I'm going to restore your inheritance to you. In other words, I'm going to restore, this is for us today, everything that the devil took from you. John 10 and 10 says, The thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Mm -hmm. What the Lord says to me is, You must know your rights under the law of God. Listen to this. You must know your rights under the laws of God. God says, the word says, you've got a legal right to take the devil to court uh -huh. and to demand full restoration uh -huh. according to Proverbs 6 and 30 through 31. And in that verse of scripture, he says, do not despise the thief if he steals to satisfy himself when he's hungry. But when he's found, when the thief is found, he must repay seven times Jesus. what he stole. Yes, Lord. And he must give his prop, the property of his house if necessary to meet the fire. Mm -hmm. What the devil has done to you is tragic, but he's got to pay you back. He's got to pay you back. Everything that he's taken from you. And not only is he, does he have to take it or pay it back, he's got to pay it back sevenfold. Yes, Hallelujah. Yes, 
You got to say, I want it back. You got to go to God and say, God, I want it back. I want my health back. I want my relationship back. I want my family back. I want my finances back. Give me back my joy. Give me back my peace. Give me back my drive. My, give me back my resolve. Give me back all of that that your nasty thing, you nasty devil took from me. And I want it back. Somebody holler with interest. Joel 2. He says in verse number 25. This is in the Amplified Bible. Joel 2 and 25 and 26 says, And I will compensate you for the years that the, the, the swarming locusts had eaten. One thing that we all seemingly can't get um, more of is time. But God says that I will, will restore. In other words, with what you have left, I'm going to I'm going to make it in such a way that you you'll forget about. All of that stuff that the enemy did to you. I will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. The locusts that ate away at you, ate away at your thoughts and your mind, ate away at your body, your physical body. He says, I will restore the creepy locusts, the stripping locusts, the gnawing locusts. You will have plenty to eat and be satisfied and bless the name of the Lord. You will have someone say plenty to eat and be satisfied. There's some areas in your life that you're not satisfied. Am I by myself? He says, but you will have plenty. And can I put it this way? Plenty of satisfaction. And praise the name of the Lord your God. Who has dealt wondrously with you. And I like this. And my people shall never be put to shame. How you feel? Jesus. I understand. God understands. He's right there with you. But he says, this is a starting point. You're coming out. This is a starting point. He has ways. He has people that can help you. And all of them not just saved and sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, with a burning fire and all that stuff. God has ways. God has people that's going to help you right where you are. He's got some folk that will come down to Lodabar and going to yoke with you and say, Girlfriend, Road dog, we we coming out of this thing together. I don't feel like it. I don't care. You be coming out. Say the right out pull you, you coming out. You've been there too long, you're coming out. Hallelujah. If I've got to be at your house every day, we coming out of this thing. 
Amen. If I gotta gotta go on your job, amen. You coming out of this thing. I don't care where you are. God said I'm there and I understand. And I, amen, am not just a, a God of the world. I'm your God. I'm your personal God. I know what you feel. And I'm going to be there every step of the way. The Bible says here that he tells him, I'm restoring what the enemy took. He says, and I like this, he told me, he says, he says and, 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 and all that land that you got, Somebody's going to need to farm that land. So there's going to be some folk there to, to work the, the property for you. Uh -huh. And they're going to give, of course, all the proceeds to you. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. He says, but as for you, you're going to sit in my table. Continually. Yes, you got to know that you have a seat at the master's table. Hallelujah. You have a seat where Jesus is. And somebody else is going to give you more. You're going to be restored. Now if he says seven times more, that, 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 what, what that says to me is that you're going to have abundance. I come that you might have life more abundantly. You're going to have more than you had last year. Oh, I wish somebody would receive that. Your bottom line is going to be greater than it was last year. Why? Because I'm coming out. I blow the bottom line. I'm stopping right there. This is just the beginning. On Tuesday night, we're going to deal with the hands-on because it's more than just talk. It's more than just confession. There's some work that's behind it. But just like the fellowship, you're going to be at the king's table. Do you know who you are? A song said, when it's all over. When it's all over. I shall wear a crown. I shall wear a crown.
you find yourself in no law. This is not a quick fix. That's not the point of the message. But it's a start. You gotta start speaking. Not where you are, but where you wanna be. somebody how I overcame the Bible said that we amen we overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the words of our testimony you can't have a testimony without a test God said you're coming out why you gotta start telling the story. I see myself in the palace. I see myself sitting at the king's table. I see myself strong. I see myself powerful. On the mountain top, I see myself crazy worshiping God. If you don't know the Lord Jesus in the parting of your sins, right where you are has now become an altar. And you can pray this simple prayer Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of all my sins. Wash me, cleanse me, make me a new Create in me a clean heart and renew the right spirit within me. Everything, Lord Jesus, I yield myself to you. I want you to be Lord of my life. Sit on the throne of my heart. If you pray that prayer, then we believe that you're on the road. You're coming out a little more. Coming out of that place, the ghetto, and coming to the palace. You come, you're coming out of a place of not enough to more than enough. You're coming out of a place of poverty to the place of prosperity. You're coming out. Of a place where you have been rejected to the place where you can now rejoice. Coming out of a place of failure to be to It's in your heart. Now it must come out of your mouth. You've got to confess. And you're on the road to recovery you are the world to recovery and I'm going to tell the story
into the brightness of thy glory. Yes. As we pray in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.